major media outlets in The Guardian, The New York Times, Le Monde, The Spiegel, El Paz collaborated uh, and published a joint statement for Julian Assange. Um, and I quote here, this indictment sets a dangerous precedent and threatens to undermine America's First Amendment and the freedom of the press. Why do you think, take, why do you think it took so long for major media outlets and benefited so much that benefited so much greatly from WikiLeaks' work to band together and finally release a statement? I don't know because I wasn't on the inside. I'm glad they did it. It's very late, but it's better than not doing it. I thought it was a good statement. I think it will certainly help. Um, whether that will get the Biden. I mean, Biden's a very timid figure. And uh, he also, I mean, he was appointed by Obama's, his vice president, because although a Democrat, he in essence voted Republican. I mean, this guy supported segregation and uh, you know, he was against school busing and he was against abortion. And he was one of the architects, and not only of the Iraq war, but the massive, expansion of our prison system, more than doubling the prison population, arming police forces with military grade weapons. This is all Biden. Uh, and the CIA wants to punish Julian, I think, for Vault 7, which exposed the hacking tools the CIA has access to in our uh, smartphones and TVs and even our cars everywhere else. Uh, so whether Biden will stand up to them I find that doubtful, but I certainly uh, thought that this statement was important uh, and probably put more pressure on the Biden administration that other supporters of Julian, such as myself, are able to do. Uh, Julian Assange's legal team will appeal the decision. Uh, and also, they, I think they're taking the route of going to the European Human Rights Court, which the UK is still obliged to. Um, if all of these attempts fail and Julian Assange is uh, extradited to the United States, do you think he will receive a fair trial uh, in the United States? No, of course not. He's being sent to the Eastern District of Virginia for a reason. That's where they lynch everyone. Um, so, but it was, we know that, that it's not a fair trial because I've sat in on the proceedings in London. Uh, look, if uh, it was a fair trial, it would be dismissed because the CIA uh, videotaped his meetings with his attorneys, eviscerating attorney-client privilege. That alone would invalidate, should invalidate the trial. And then there's all sorts of other issues. I mean, let's begin with the fact that he didn't commit a crime. He hasn't committed a crime. Uh uh, unless you consider jumping bail. I mean, maybe that's the only crime they could pin, a, pin on him. Uh, but it's certainly for what he's charged with. He's, so uh, those proceedings have a kind of Alice in Wonderland quality to them, you know, where the Queen of Hearts says, uh, let's, announced, let's announce the, uh, the sentence uh, before you hear the evidence. So that's kind of what's happening. And Baritza already has everything written out on her laptop. I mean, she uh, she was the lawyer in the lower court who, uh, uh, it, it's it's a kangaroo court, it's a show trial. It's, it's uh, you know, not uh, the best of uh, British jurisprudence, but uh, stinks of the kind of Lou Bianca. And I think that's why they make it so difficult to cover. It must, for anybody who has any shred of credibility, it must be a phenomenal embarrassment because it uh, it just shows the bankruptcy of the legal system in this particular case. A lot of uh, uh, supporters of Julian Assange also watch our channel. Uh, for them watching right now, what do you think ordinary people can do in order uh, to uh, stop this extradition or at least uh, create as much as awareness as possible in this case? A protest because, you know, I was in the courtroom when Baritza started complaining about the noise outside. So they know people are out there. Uh, and I think that's, you know, we have to, pro I was invited, as you may know, to Julian's wedding. Um, there were six of us. We didn't get in. The, the prison authorities wouldn't let us in. Uh, but uh, we, I mean, it didn't matter. They didn't want me to write about it, obviously. So, but I just went home with Stella and John and Gabriel and everyone else from his family and interviewed them and wrote about it anyway. 
um, every effort to humanize Julian, of course, is something that they block. Uh, but I think the protests, they have an effect. Uh, they, they, I, I was in the courtroom when she wouldn't have mentioned it if it didn't disconcert her. Twelve years ago, major media outlets in The Guardian, The New York Times, Le Monde, The Spiegel, Epos, collaborated to publish 250,000 classified U.S. documents that were attained and published by WikiLeaks. Now these media outlets, after almost um, 10 years, 11 years, have come out with a statement in support of Julian Assange, and if I could quote them, they state, this indictment sets a dangerous precedent and threatens to undermine America's First Amendment and the freedom of the press. Why do you think it took so long for major media outlets that benefit so greatly from the work of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange to finally band together and take a stance on this issue? I think, again, it's another sign of the times. It's a sign of the corruption of mainstream media. Uh, media has been corporatized. It's been uh, consolidated into the hands of a very powerful few. And, you know, on a daily basis, they fail to cover, you know, critical world events, you know. And going back as far as you like, you know, you can see every U.S. war really ginned up without exceptions from the incubator babies the mythology used to justify the first Gulf War, to the weapons of mass destruction, to the yellow cake, to uh, remember the Maine, you know, and the um, uh, the Spanish-American War at the turn of the, uh, you know, going into 1900. Um, you know, big media has been a big cheerleader for uh, for war and. We fundamentally need to restructure media in the same way, you know, there's much ado right now about who owns Twitter. We should own Twitter, you know. This should be a public square which is responsible um, for, you know, uh, for having an even hand and being a non-partial arbiter and not being a, um, a collaborator of the CIA and the FBI to basically wage propaganda on the American people. So, you know, this is a patient uh, right now that has multi-system failure and is hanging on by a thread on life support in the intensive care unit. And each of us needs to consider ourselves that patient. Our lives are hanging in the balance right now. And we need to fight for democracy, including free speech, including the liberation of Julian Assange and the many other political prisoners out there held by the US, but not only by the US, held by Russia, held by you know, lots of countries around the world. Uh, we need those reforms. We need them now and we need to fight for them peacefully, but we need to fight for them like our lives depend on it. And, you know, the good news is that people get what's going on. They are not being fooled here. So there's an enormous amount of, of public will that we can work with here. Um, but we need to be, uh, you know, very clear eyed that the empire is not our friend, that the economic elites and the political elites are also not our friend. Uh, you know, we need a, an agenda for people, planet, and peace over profit that is fighting for a system change in a world that works for all of us that we can actually survive on. You know, this is kind of the moment of truth that's come back to haunt us right now, and uh, we need to step up to the plate. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard about this, because as I have read that you don't uh, look at Hollywood a lot, but this is another question that I would like to ask you from the public. There was a big trial um, on this Hollywood actor Johnny Depp and his ex-wife Amber Heard. The trial was followed by millions and even billions of people worldwide. Almost all major media outlets gave razor sharp coverage of the trial. By contrast, however, the press freedom trial of the century, the case of Julian Assange, who may be extradited to the US soon, has not received even a fraction of this coverage. Can you explain 
why people are so disinterested in the case Assange and why the media ignores it and gives something like a Hollywood scandal much more coverage than a scandal involving press freedom and democracy. Well, Julian Assange committed a major crime. He acted as an honest journalist. Can't have that. There are things that systems of power want to be concealed from the population. Assange violated that. He brought to the general population information that they have every right to have and that power systems don't want them to have. Information about war crimes, for example. Well, that's a crime. You have to be punished for that. So he's been kept in conditions of virtual torture for six years now. Uh, first isolated in an apartment. Ecuadorian embassy is a small apartment. I visited him there. He had fewer rights than a prisoner on death row who can at least walk outside and see the sun, not Assange. Then the British put him in a high security prison for the crime of not paying bail. Okay. Uh, the UN rapporteur on torture simply described this as torture. He's uh, personally practically destroyed. Now he's facing extradition to the United States where could spend the rest of his life such as it is in a high security prison. Well, that's punishment for a major crime. You don't tell citizens things they ought to know, but the powerful don't want them to know. And the failure of most journalists to defend him is outrageous. They're the ones who should be right in the front defending him. Some are very good ones, but too many are not. It's a real scandal. Also a scandal in Australia. He's an Australian citizen. Australia should have been pressing hard for him to be released to Australia at the very beginning of this. Uh, everyone in the world is afraid of stepping on the toes of the United States. Might as well face it. The world is you know, international relations specialists can publish their essays, but the fact is that the world is run very much like the mafia. If the godfather lays down orders, you better follow them or you're in trouble. We see this all over, like take the Iran situation. The United States pulled out of the joint agreement the nuclear agreement in violation of Security Council orders. It imposed very harsh sanctions to punish Iran for the fact that the United States is violating the agreement. Europe doesn't like it. Europe opposes the sanctions. It's been spoken out strongly against them, but it follows them. It adheres to them because you don't anger the Godfather pretend whatever you like, but that's the way the world works. Same on the Cuba sanctions. Uh, 60 years of torture of Cuba, uh, the whole world is against it. You look at the UN votes, uh, 184 to 2, United States and Israel, but everyone adheres to it. Same reason. You don't anger the godfather who has plenty of weapons to punish you more weapons thanks to Putin's stupidity. I want to switch gears here and now focus on Julian Assange. Before I start digging deeper into the topic, I just want you to talk about how culpable is the media in today's um, uh, the, the result that has come out that Julian Assange will be extradited to the United States, what role have they played so far? Well, so a lot of you probably know that during the Trump years, one of the main concerns the media expressed was whether press freedoms would be attacked by Donald Trump. 
the Washington Post very early on in the Trump presidency adopted a new motto, a corporate motto that appears at the top of the page that says democracy dies in darkness. There were a lot of claims that Trump was a grave threat to press freedoms because he would often be critical of the press. He would insult the media. He called the press the enemy of the people. The gravest threat to press freedom that happened during the Trump presidency, by far, by far, not even close, was the indictment of Julian Assange, where they're trying to charge him with 18 felony counts under the Espionage Act, the same law they used against Edward Snowden, the same law they're using again, they used against Daniel Ellsberg, the leaker of the Pentagon Papers in 1971, to say that he committed crimes in connection with the publication of those documents provided to him by Chelsea Manning in 2010. It doesn't have anything to do with the 2016 election or his role in that, at least formally. There's nothing in the indictment that has anything to do with that. But the argument is that by publishing those documents and working the way he did with Chelsea Manning, he became a criminal. So the theory used to criminalize him, if adopted, would essentially criminalize all investigative journalism because everything he said to have done that makes him a criminal, namely helping Chelsea Manning try and evade detection, encouraging Chelsea Manning to provide more documents, soliciting materials from the public, and encouraging people to hand over classified information are things investigative journalists, if they're good, do all of the time. I, I talked before about how the first article I ever wrote about the dangers of the Assange indictment was in May of 2019, in June of 2019, I, with my colleagues in Brazil, started a year-long investigative expose of showing the corruption on the part of high-level officials in the Bolsonaro government. And in January of 2020, I was criminally indicted by the Brazilian government using exactly the same theory the U.S. government was using to and is using to prosecute Assange. The Supreme Court intervened in my case and essentially issued a ruling that said that would be a violation of my press freedom. That's the only reason I'm not arrested and in prison is because of that ruling. But this theory is incredibly dangerous to anyone around the world who does journalism. And remember, what it, one of the things that makes it extra dangerous is Julian Assange is not an American citizen. He's not on U.S. soil. The U.S. is reaching across the world to try and nab him and bring him back to the United States, a country to which he has no connection which I presume means that if the New York Times publishes secret documents from Iran, as it's done, or Russia or China, any of those governments under this theory would have the right to extradite those reporters to their countries and charge them with harming national security or espionage. And yet you hear almost no complaints, no concerns, no warnings from the American media. They were hysterical every time Trump would tweet an insult about some TV personality as though that was a grave attack on press freedom. Here you have an actual attack on press freedom. Some of them, when Trump did it, came out in defense of Assange. But now that it's the Biden administration that has picked up this case and is aggressively pursuing it and refuses to drop it, there's almost no coverage of the case at all, let alone of the case at all, let alone denunciations about what the Biden administration is doing because the American media hates Julian Assange so much. They hate him for personality reasons. They hate him because of jealousy that he's broken so many stories more than they ever have or will. They hate him because they perceive that he helped Trump in the 2016 election by reporting accurately on Hillary Clinton. So the hatred level for Julian Assange is so great that almost nobody in the American media is even covering the story, let alone objecting and that, of course, is a major reason why the U.S. government is getting away with trying to drag him back to the United States and keep him in prison forever. So Julian Assange was spied upon while he was in the Ecuadorian embassy. He, in addition, there were plans discussed by the CIA and other government actors to assassinate him. Lastly, the star witness of the U.S., who has a documented history of several convictions for sexual abuse of minors and even for committing financial fraud admitted to fabricating key accusations against Assange. These facts received little to no attention in the German media when the verdict came. Um, it was just presented very objectively. 
So in your assessment, why do you think these facts were not given the weight that they deserved in the British court? So for example, if Navalny was tried in Russia and all of these things were done by the Russian government, we would have seen a big coverage and weightage put on these facts. Why do you think these developments were just simply thrown out by the British court? You know, it's amazing. Um, I visited Julian Assange in, I believe it was 2018 in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. I visited him as a journalist. I was I visited him with my husband, David Miranda, who's a member, an elected member of the Brazilian Congress, who's a member of the Foreign Relations Committee and was traveling on a diplomatic Brazilian passport to London. We went there to do an event together about what happened at Heathrow Airport during the Snowden reporting to David and, and we went and visited the embassy and we were among the people who were spied on by this private contractor hired by the CIA, as were many other people. An incredible breach of diplomatic um, protocols of press freedom, of privacy. Beyond that, you know, he is suffering greatly inside of that embassy, every uh, or inside the, the prison where he is, his his doctors have said that his physical and mental health are deteriorating rapidly, and yet there's very little coverage of it. And what you have instead is the American media, the German media, the British media, they love to accuse other countries of attacking journalists. They love to talk about what Putin has done to Navalny, what China has done to journalists, all of which may be true, but what standing moral credibility does the United States and the UK have to condemn other countries for punishing journalists or attacking press freedoms when the person who I would argue is one of the most consequential journalists of our generation, if not the most consequential, is imprisoned by both of those governments, maltreated in every way imaginable, his basic human rights and political rights violated for years with almost no objection. It's you know something that every other country in the world will just laugh at when the US and the UK pretend to be able to denounce other countries for attacks on press freedom. And they should be laughed at because they are among the worst violators. Thank you very much. It's uh, a pleasure to be with you. It, it's difficult to be here. I struggle to understand how we can be here after so many years. Uh, there has been, there have been so many stories told. There's been so much criticism. Uh, there has been so much deception. And where has it brought us? Uh, has this been constructive? Is this a victory for us, for the state, for humanity, for our rights? Um, when I came forward in 2013, uh, I said the reason that I came forward uh, was that we have a right to know uh, that which is done to us and that which is done in our name by our governments. Uh, that was already under threat. And when you look at the world since, uh, it, it seems that that trend is accelerating. Do we still have that right? Do we have any rights uh, if we don't defend them? Well, today we see someone who has stood up to defend that right, uh, who has aggressively championed that right at an extreme cost. Uh, and it's time for us to defend his rights. What we're witnessing is a murder that passes without comment. Uh, and, I, and I want to say uh, that it is difficult for me to comprehend the spectacle of uh, the, the press of a nation or the, the developed world. Uh, aiding and abetting with full knowledge uh, a crime not only against this man, but against our public interest. <sighs> However, at, at this moment, that we are, we, we all see this, we all feel it. Uh, it, it, it's no less familiar than the shoes on my feet. Everywhere we look, from Afghanistan to economics, from pandemic to pervasive surveillance, the obvious has been made unspeakable. Uh, it has become unspeakable because the truth of our circumstances could be taken as evidence in the defense of the actions of the outer favor. And in the eyes of the American state, 
few represent this class, a greater object of hatred than the person of Julian Assange. Uh, he has been charged as a political criminal, well, something that I understand quite well, but he has been charged as the purest sort of political criminal for having committed the transgression of choosing the wrong side. The, the charges, which are, they, they are absolutely an unadorned legal fiction. Uh, we, we are told to believe uh, that the state has these, these powers over what can be said and what can't be said, the, the things that can and cannot be said. But what happens if we permit that? Where does that lead? What are we? Can we be said to be free if even our power to express ourselves, to understand the facts of our world can be uh, fenced off from us? That we look beyond through the gauze, through the veil, at what could be the facts of the world, uh, but we're not permitted to um, acquire them. Julian Assange did not accept that, and the charges against him reduced to an allegation to commit the crime of journalism uh, in the first degree, which is to say when we look at it applied elsewhere, the same sort of publication of classified material that we see in the New York Times or the Washington Post, aggravated by a conspiracy to accomplish the same, which is simply uncovering an uncomfortable truth. But something distinguishes Julian Assange from the greatest newspapers of our day, and that is his independence. Uh, Julian Assange is not a person who will be told no lightly. I remember uh, in the case of 2013, when I came forward and revealed evidence of mass surveillance, uh, which the government uh, of my country had uh, constructed the apparatus of mass surveillance, uh, an entire scheme that spanned the globe, uh, with the participation of Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and of course, the United Kingdom. And when the newspapers of all of these countries began publishing uh, these things, one of the papers who held uh, the archive of material originally included uh, The Guardian, uh, who was headquartered in uh, the United Kingdom, still is. Uh, and I remember reading a, a story, of course, I wasn't there for it personally, I'm getting this second hand. Uh, who knows what we can rely on in this, this state of journalism as it is today. But they were approached by the British state who said, okay, okay, uh, you've had your fun, you've done enough, now it's time to stop. And they uh, had to send their archival material away to the United States, to a partner uh, publication, because they no longer uh, believed that they were safe to continue publishing. And they were right. Uh, agents of the British state went to the Guardian. Uh, they destroyed their laptop computers. They've got it on film. Uh, putting angle grinders to computer chips, trying to erase any trace that, that these stories had been written uh, from within the, uh, the confines of the newsroom. Now, Julian was not deterred uh, by that, and he never would be. Uh, when you perform the level of surveillance uh, against a person that has clearly been performed and is being performed even today, certainly in prison uh, against Julian Assange, you understand at least something about that character. You understand uh, what the breaking point is. You know what it'll take uh, to make them bend. Um, and he didn't bend. Uh, he will break before he does. He has consistently and continuously dared to speak the unspeakable in the face of opposition, uh, in the face of power. And that is a remarkable and rare thing. That is the reason that Julian Assange sits in prison today. If you love the truth, as I, I think everyone here does, you, you wouldn't be listening to this, you wouldn't be watching this, you wouldn't be participating in this, you wouldn't care about this unless something in you told you that something important was happening here. Uh, and if you do care, as I think you do, uh, you are a criminal of the same category as Julian Assange. In the eyes of the state, 
what differentiates you, what divides you from him, that is only the degree. We share the same guilt. Each of us share in the crime, uh, and we are unin <laughs> unindicted co-conspirators in his quest to raise a lantern in the halls of power. Each of us shares in the forbidden desire to see justice done not merely to the instruments of these darkest moments uh, of the human condition that we've heard about all day here, uh, torture, extrajudicial killings, uh, aggressive war, uh, but to see justice done to their architects. And I have to say um, here, each of us will also share, and to me it will happen without the faintest regret, in his ultimate fate, if we do not stop what is happening now. What is happening to Julian Assange is a crime, and he must be freed. If we're going to free the world, we have to free Assange. Thank you, and stay free.